We'll go ahead and begin this evening. As we begin, we certainly want to uh, welcome everyone who's with us. Our members, we're always glad to see you attending on Wednesday night. And of course, those who are visiting, we're thankful, grateful for your presence. Uh, we hope that for all of us, that our study tonight will be immensely profitable. And I emphasize that because God's Word is profitable. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, and I'm convinced that if we stay with His Word and handle it aright, then it will be profitable. It'll be immensely profitable for each and every one of us. And so let's listen attentively as we get back to this series we're looking at, as you well know, the parables of Jesus. And I just want to mention, we've covered several parables, but I just want to bring to light again the last two, coupled with the one that we'll be studying tonight, because they all really have a common theme. They have something that ties them, binds them together. And so, remember, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the parable of two prayers. Uh, this is also referred to as the parable of the Pharisee and the publican, Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. And then last week, Brother Gary Chambers led you in a study of the parable of the unrighteous judge. Uh, this preceded in Luke 18, the parable that we just mentioned. Uh, Luke 18, verses 1 through 8, you have the parable of the widow, the parable of the unrighteous judge. And we certainly thank Gary for leading the class in that study. You know, last Sunday... Sean McKinney was talking to me and he was just mentioning how many men we have that are capable, very capable of teaching and preaching God's Word. And he was just so impressed with that and I always have been too, so thankful for that. And of course, Gary is one of those men, so we appreciate his efforts in this. And, and then tonight what we're looking at is the parable of a friend at midnight. Uh, this will take us to Luke 11, verses 5 through 8. And really these last two, the widow and the unrighteous judge, and this friend at midnight, these are sort of companion parables, if you will. Uh, they are twin parables. You remember the verse in Amos 3 and verse 3? Can two walk together except they be agreed? And you know that that's true. Two can't walk together unless they're in agreement, these two parables are put together because they're in agreement. They're really teaching the same point. And the point, as we'll see again tonight, is that of persistence. Let's be persistent in prayer. That's the only reason the widow's request was answered. It wasn't because the judge was touched by her need. Now, remember that man, he, he didn't fear God, and nor did he regard man. So her needs meant nothing to him. The only reason he, you know, fulfilled her request was lest she, by her continual coming, wear me out. And so, again, we're going to see that same thought tonight. A request is granted, not because a friend made the request, but because of his continual asking, because of his importunity. You know, that term we'll mention in a moment again, importunity, uh, it really means, it's translated in some translations, shamelessness. And so again, this is persistence with a shamelessness about it. They're, they're not ashamed because they're persisting. They're going to continue to knock. They're going to continue to ask until they receive what they need. And so these two parables, and again tonight, here's what we want to do. What these all have in common is prayer. All of these, these last three, considering the one tonight also. Again, two men went up to the temple. Remember, they were praying, the Pharisee, the publican. And again, in Luke 18, what sparked that parable was verse 1. Remember when uh, you know, Jesus taught a parable that all men ought always to pray and not lose heart. And so he's talking about prayer. 
And then in this one, now we'll probably be looking at this more next week. We'll be looking at lessons learned from this friend at midnight. But remember in Luke, the 11th chapter, what happens at the very beginning, Jesus is praying. And when he stops praying, his disciples say, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples to pray. And so verse one, everybody's praying. Jesus is a prayerful individual. John was a prayerful individual. John taught his disciples to pray. Jesus' disciples want him now to teach them to pray. And so again, prayer. Prayer is what all of these parables have in common. And so let's do this. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to read again Luke 18, verses 1 through 8. This is what Gary led it led us in a discussion about last Wednesday. But listen to this one again, because then we're going to turn around and and read Luke 11, verses 5 through 8. And here's what I want you to be looking for, some similarities between these two. Look for what they have in common, because after we just read these, we'll look at some similarities. And then we'll come back and go to the friend at midnight And we'll look at that textually, okay? But read this with me. And again, be thinking about now in hearing this, keep it in your mind because as we read again Luke 11, I want you to look for these similarities, what they have in common. Verse 1, Then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterwards he said within himself, Though I do not fear God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continually coming she wear me, or lest by her continual coming she weary me. Look at verse 6. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall not God avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? So you heard this last week. We've read it again. Remember what we're talking about. This widow... Going before the judge, the judge is not a good man. The judge is unrighteous. He doesn't fear God. He does not regard man. Will not grant her the request until she keeps coming. Now, let's look at this. Luke 11, verses 5 through 8. Notice verse 5. And he said to them, Which of you shall have a friend? And go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you that though he will not rise and give to him because he's his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. Now, Notable similarities. You know, before I start mentioning some of my own, anybody want to offer one more that you hear from Luke 18, you hear from Luke 11? What's a similarity? What do both of these have in common? Anyone? What was that? Persistence. Okay. Persistence. Uh, Again, We cannot emphasize this enough. Uh, We are not to come to our God only in a midnight crisis. As we're looking at this parable, you know, it was about midnight. He has to go to his friend. Well, don't just pray during a midnight crisis. That's part of the point. You be persistent in prayer all the time. You have that habit of prayer. You can't help when you read these parables. You can't help but think about 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 17. Pray without ceasing. Again, be persistent in prayer. A notable similarity in both of these. 
Anything else? Similarities? What? They both had a need. Okay. They both had a need. And again, remember now, this need was not going to be fulfilled by them. The widow is a vulnerable character. She doesn't have anybody to take care of her. Obviously, in her state as being a widow, her husband is gone. And so she can't fulfill what she needs. She has a need, but she has to go elsewhere to get it fulfilled. This man has nothing to set before his friend who's now at his doorstep. And so he can't fulfill that need, needs that cannot be fulfilled by us. Well, we ask the question, how are they fulfilled? Well, we pray. We pray. Give us this day our daily bread. Remember Matthew 6 and verse 11? And I want you to keep that in mind because in a moment I'm going to ask a question about that. Give us this need our daily, or give us this day our, give us this day. <laughs> I've messed that up, haven't I? Give us this day our daily bread. I don't even know what I said before that. <laughs> but my wife thinks it's pretty humorous. Okay. Now, any other similarities? Any other? Now, look at this with me. This first similarity. Each parable contains two main characters. Now, in the first one, Luke 18, we have the widow and we have the unrighteous judge. Pretty prominent, those two characters, main characters. And the one that we're looking at tonight, Luke 11, and of course, verses 5 through 8, what we have here is we have a man and his friend. And this man, remember, we'll, we'll look at this again, but this man has a friend come who's journeying, and the man has nothing to give him. You know, the law of hospitality, that was immense with the Jews. And so, again, he couldn't provide this man anything to eat. So this man goes to his friend, this friend who's at home, this friend who's asleep, this friend who is very reluctant. But two main characters, each one of these parables contain two main characters. Each one has a third character in its supporting cast. Go back to the one in Luke 18, there's the widow, there's the unrighteous judge. But remember, she's saying, get me justice from my adversary. Someone has dealt her wrong. Someone was not good to her, and so she needs justice from the judge. Get me justice from this adversary. And of course, the third character in the one before us, Luke 11, uh, is, is the man who was journeying. Okay, that's the third character. Now, another similarity. The man in Luke 11, verses 5 through 8, and the widow, in Luke 18, verses 1 through 8, had nowhere else to turn. Our sisters already mentioned this. They had needs, but they couldn't turn anywhere else. They couldn't provide for their needs. You remember Philippians 4 and verse 19? My God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. That's really a beautiful verse for many reasons, but put it back in the original context. Paul is commending his brethren in Philippi because they have, from the very first day, taken care of his needs. There was a time that they couldn't because of poverty, but now they have regained some wealth, if you will, some substance, and so they can help him now. And lest they begin to think, you know, we don't have much, and what we're giving to Paul, now who's going to take care of us? We're giving this to Paul to take care of him, but it's not like we have an abundance of wealth ourselves. Who's going to take care of us? Paul answers that. My God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. When God supplies our needs, it's not meagerly. It's according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. 
And so they had nowhere else to turn. Notice another similarity. Both the friend and the judge expressed unwillingness, not inability to grant the request. It's obvious from the outcome of both of those parables, they had the ability. They just didn't want to do it. They were unwilling. Again, remember, the only reason the unrighteous judge granted the widow her request, she's going to weary me. She's going to wear me out. She's going to keep coming and keep coming. And so let me just address it, get her out of my hair. That's basically the, the attitude. And again, the man in the house he said, do not trouble me. You know, the door is shut. The children are asleep. I'm not going to get up. It wasn't because he couldn't. Because again, the parable shows us that he finally did. They were unwilling. Now, somewhere in our study on parables, I want to present some thoughts from various parables about lessons we ought not learn. And here's one lesson we shouldn't learn. Let's not ever compare our God to that unrighteous judge. Don't ever compare him to the friend who's lying there asleep, who was unwilling. Really just the opposite is being taught about our God. He's willing. He wants us to come to him. He wants to provide our needs. And so that's one lesson we, we shouldn't learn from any of these parables. And notice this last one. Both the man and the widow had the request granted because of their persistence. Remember what Jim said? It's persistence. Now, I'm going to use a statement that we've all heard, and I'm sort of hesitant to use it because I don't want to sound like, let's be complaining, let's be murmuring. Remember Philippians 2 and verse 14, do all things without murmuring or complaining. But I think you'll be able to see how this, you know, little maxim works in what we're talking about. The squeaky wheel gets the oil. There's a need there. Now, we use it for one who's always squeaking and always complaining and, and finally. But what we're saying with our use of it is when there's a legitimate need, when the wheel is really squeaking, what do we do? We tend to it. We give it what it needs. Usually that's a shot of WD-40, isn't it? It works for almost anything. And so, but again, granted because of their persistence. And so look at the note. It was not because he was a friend, nor because the judge was touched. This judge was not touched by her needs. And the man didn't get up and say, oh man, I'm so glad to see you. Even though it's midnight, you're welcome here anytime. No, that wasn't it. Persistence. That's the only reason. Now, as we go back to this context, and notice we're just dealing with four verses. Is it not truly amazing what Jesus could say in such a short, short space? Four verses, yet he gives us something here that we can ponder for a long time. And we need to do just that, like Brother Ken said. We need to, you know, listen to the Word. We need to eat the Word up. We need to digest it. We need to let it do in our lives what it can, and that is to strengthen us, just like physical food does. Now, before we start reading this and making some comments... Any observations, anything that comes to mind since we've gone through these similarities and read these contexts? Anybody? Brother Ralph? Do, I, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. We, we lost our runner. Tyler was our runner. <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks for throwing a monkey wrench in, in our study tonight, huh? No, it's true. Sometimes when it is just that constant complaining, it needs to be removed. But again, we're talking about legitimate needs here. And when we talk about that squeaky wheel, hey, the wheel is squeaking for a reason. 
And so let's find out what its need is. Let's, let's give it what it needs. Brother Elsie. Okay, I think, I think I heard that God always listens. Okay, I might not have gotten that. Okay, okay. Very, very good point. He, he does not sleep. He does not slumber. And so, again, I mean, prayer, one of the precious things about it, it's available to us 24-7. We don't have to say, well, I, I can't pray right now because it's probably too late. You've probably been up late at night and you think about something you said well I can't call him now I can't call this person now because it's too late well as brother Elsie points out you know unlike that friend at midnight God is not bound by time is he he is eternal we're the ones that are so confined by time not him and so he, he always wants us to come he always delights in hearing from us Remember Proverbs 15 and verse 8, the prayer of the upright is his delight. It doesn't say as long as it's between these, these times, I'll, I'll listen and I'll be delighted any time. Prayer of the upright is his delight. Let's go back now. Let's look at this. Here's verse 5. And he said to them, which of you shall have a friend? And go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. Now, right now, we don't know why he's asked for three loaves. We'll find out in the very next verse. But in this verse, I love what Jesus does, and he always does that. He, he draws people into his teaching. Which of you? Which of you? So he throws it out as an umbrella statement. And I'm sure they're already all thinking, which, which of us what? You know, what about, what about me? And so he says, which of you shall have a friend? Well, he's hit upon a very sweet thought there. All of them have friends. Which one of you shall have a friend? And really, you could call this parable right here the parable of three friends. Because there is a friend that is journeying. He is traveling. There is a friend who is, you know, persistent He's the one that has nothing, but he's going to be persistent. And there's another friend that he goes to, and he's reluctant. At first, he's unwilling. And so this is a parable not only about prayer, but about friends. But Jesus asked the question, which of you shall have a friend? And go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. Now notice again, an inopportune time. You've got a friend, all right, but he's going to be a friend after you go to him at midnight. <laughs> that friendship, might, he might defriend you. I don't know how they do that on Facebook. I'm not on Facebook. But again, he might be defriended. It's midnight. If you were my friend, you wouldn't be outside my door hollering, okay? But it's midnight. And he says to him, friend, lend me three loaves. Three loaves is about the provisions for a common meal. That's what he's asking for. And we see why, we see why in this very next verse. Here's why he makes the request. For a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. This was an appalling state for a Jew. The Jews, as we should today, we should cherish friendship. And with that friendship, there is a, quote, law of hospitality. And so this man couldn't be hospitable. You know, you look at John 13, and what did Jesus do to the disciples? He washed their feet. That, that was part of the hospitality. You go to John 7, and when Jesus is in the house of Simon the Pharisee, there is a, a woman who her past was quite checkered, and she comes in, and of course, Simon the Pharisee doesn't like it. 
Jesus says, Simon, I have something to say to you. And Simon says, say on. And so he points out that I entered your house and, and you didn't wash my feet. You didn't do anything that is normal. But this woman hasn't ceased. She hasn't ceased to wash my feet with her tears. And so, again, the law of hospitality, the Jews expected and looked forward to being hospitable one to another. In fact, turn with me, if you will, to Romans 12. Look at Romans 12, what Paul says, and, and this is just a practical point for all of us. Romans 12, look at verse 13. Paul talks about distributing to the needs of the saints given to hospitality. And so, again, this man couldn't be given to hospitality because he had nothing to share. He couldn't provide this man a meal. Uh, think about this. We won't go back here, but in Genesis 18, pretty interesting in verses 2 and following what Abraham does for the men who come. Uh, he, he's going to, you know, have a meal baked for them. He's going to take the, the kid and have it prepared for them. And he, he's doing everything for them. This is the law of hospitality. In the very next chapter, Lot does that to the two men, to the two angels. Remember when they are with Lot and they're going to sleep out in the open square and he says, no, not a good idea at all. You come to me, uh, with me to my house. And he prepares for them a meal for them. This is what was to be expected. But the man arrives at midnight. And obviously this family, their daily provisions were gone. They had eaten their daily provisions. And that leads me to what I want to think about for just a moment. I don't want us to get off this track, but think about this. Because as I was looking and studying and, and thinking, pondering about this, I thought, you know, if somebody appeared upon our doorstep about midnight, probably wouldn't be a problem for anybody here. We might not be able to make them a gourmet meal, a gourmet meal but we could go to the pantry, we could go to the refrigerator. We have abundance here. Let me see the hands. Let me just see the hands. Well, you don't even have to do this. I don't want to embarrass anybody. But, but just think with me. How many of us right now, if we couldn't go to the store again for a while, how many could make it one day? We've got enough at home for one day. Anybody make it two days? Anybody make it three days? Four days? You see what I'm saying? These people lived day by day. Give us this day our daily bread. Maybe if we only had provisions for one day, we'd be more prayerful. We'd be more understanding of where our blessings truly come from. Give us this month our monthly provisions. You know, you know even if we couldn't provide a meal, we can run them down to McDonald's, open 24 hours a day. And, but, but we're talking about a different culture here, a different time, a different setting a different, you know, prosperity level. And so a friend of mine has come to me on his journey and I have nothing to set before him. Think about this now. Why would the friend show up at midnight? Probably, probably to avoid the intense heat of journeying through the day. This, this is common practice here. He shows up at midnight. Why not earlier? Why would he show up at this time? Because he didn't leave during the heat of the day. He waited until it cooled down so he could journey. And so at midnight he arrives, catches his friend off guard. The friend quickly thinks, I have a friend that I can go to and, and he can give me three pieces of bread. Well, look at this next verse. Here's the response from inside the house. And he will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me. The door is not shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. You know, have you ever been startled at midnight? 
something happens similar to this, it sort of catches you off guard. But think about this. It was common for the houses in this time to be small, okay? Again, we're thinking about our refrigerators. We're thinking about our pantries. We're thinking of our two, three, four bedroom houses. This house was one room. And within that one room, they did their sitting. They did their dining, their eating. They, they did their sleeping. They had mats that they would roll out at night. And it was like, you know, boom, boom, boom. You're all just sleeping next to each other. And the door, there's one door to these little houses. It's open during the day for ventilation, for breezes, if there were breezes. It's shut and locked at night so no intruders could come in. And so think about this. It's midnight. It's dark. They're asleep. All of a sudden a friend comes and he says, friend, give me three pieces of bread. Well, do not trouble me. Go back to Luke 18 with me. Remember, this is what the judge said. She troubles me. Well, it's trouble to answer someone's request. It's trouble here. Don't trouble me. Really, in essence, this man's going to say no, 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 four times. Do not trouble me. There's the first no. The door is now shut. There's a second no. My children are with me in bed. There's a third no. And I cannot rise and give to you. That's no, 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 and no. I'm sure he's thinking, what do you not understand about no? He's not going to do it. Do not trouble me. Again, the door is now shut. Remember, it's open during the day, shut at night. From what I can find out about the common door, it had rings on the door and a ring on the wall, and there was a, a wooden bar that would slide through those rings. And again, my children are with me in bed. They're all asleep. Remember what we said, they've taken their mats, they've lied down together. And so think about the, <laughs> the, the hassle, if you will, about getting up. It's dark in the house. You're going to have to get up, step probably on one of your children. You're going to wake the whole household. You're going to find the lamp. You're going to light that lamp. You're going to see if there's any provisions that you have Remember, this man doesn't have any bread left. And so we're looking for provisions. We've got to get those provisions to the door and unbolt the door. And, and so the man is thinking, I'm sure in his mind, it's better for one person to go hungry until morning than for me to wake up my whole household. Well, why am I going to do that? If the man's that unprepared, just let him wait until morning. That's what they would do. They'd get up in the morning and they would cook the bread for that day. And so, again, do not trouble me. The door is now shut. My children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. Jesus concludes this. Remember which of you? I'm sure the people are wondering, what's he going to say? You know, which of you shall have a friend? And, and what's this story about a friend? And how's this story going to turn out about my friend? Well, Jesus, as I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. Persistence. You remember the Syrophoenician woman when she kept asking in Matthew 15, Jesus, for help? Basically, he said the same thing, no, no, no. She kept on asking, your faith is great. Because of her persistence, her request was answered. We need to remember this lesson again in prayer. You know, in Luke 18, the widow's asking for her own needs. In Luke 11, this man is asking for the needs of someone else. But it doesn't matter. Whether you're praying for your own needs, whether you're praying for the needs of someone else, don't just pray in crisis at midnight. Be persistent. Don't give up. I don't know if the man is knocking at the door, but, but I'll guarantee you, you know, if he's knocking, it's not just a, a timid tapping. 
He's letting the ones in the house know, I'm here, I'm not going away. When I lived in Flint, Michigan, I think about this because times are, are different. And again, even from the north to the south, habits are different. What we used to do is when we were going over to the friend's house, we would just get to the back door and then we'd holler out our friend's name. You know, I had two, two friends about three houses down, Doug and Bob Reese. And so whichever one I wanted to, to see that day, I'd walk up to the back door and just holler out, Bob. And Bob would come out. He'd come to my house, Ken. I'd go out. So the man's saying, friend, give me three pieces of bread. This is at midnight in the silence. He, he wants the one in bed. Don't trouble me. Don't keep this up. But he does keep it up. He's persistent. A persistent. Remember, that shamelessness. He's not ashamed to ask a second time. He's not ashamed to ask a third time. He's not ashamed to ask as many times as it takes. Now, we're not talking about, you know, Hebrews 4 and verse 16 tells us to approach God's throne of grace boldly. But we're not talking about standing at the throne of grace demanding that God listen to my prayer, that God answers it right now. We're not talking about that, but we are talking about being persistent. Having in my mind the fact that I'm like that widow. I'm one of God's children. I can't provide for myself. And if my father doesn't provide, I go without. And it's just like that friend. He, he understood if I don't get some bread from my friend, he's traveled all evening. He's here at midnight. He's probably famished. He needs something. We're talking about praying without ceasing. Now let's do this. If you will, this next week, read uh, Luke 11, verses 1 through 4, what happens before this parable. And then also Luke 11, verses 9 through 13, what happens after this parable. Some of the lessons that we're going to take from this context come from all of those sources. It does come from this parable. But it also comes from what happened before what happens after this parable. But if nothing else, if nothing else, this should encourage us, challenge us to be more persistent in prayer. Daniel knew that the injunction was signed. He knew that now it was against the law to pray. What did he do? <laughs> he was persistent. Daniel 6 and verse 10. He went back to his house, opened his windows toward Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day, as was his habit. He had a habit of prayer. And not even an injunction signed by a king was going to stop that habit of prayer. Persistence. Only four verses, but as our Lord tells this story, what a story it is and what lessons we should get out of it. Again, great to see everyone tonight. Thank you for your comments. Come next Wednesday night with, with at least one lesson. One lesson that we can learn from this parable before us. And so that's your homework assignment. Okay.